but what we do, particularly when the principles of God's kingdom clash with those of the world. When Hollywood, for example, blasphemes our God or glamorizes sin, do you make a stand or take a fall? Do you, as King David said, hate the work of those who fall away? Or do you allow it entrance to your heart? Does the music you listen to exalt God or the flesh of man? Does it build up or tear down? Does it purify or pollute? Are you weeping beside the rivers of Babylon? Or have you, like so many in today's church, gone in for a little swim? And finally, ask yourself, in which kingdom am I investing my money? This question relates very closely to the other three because, as Jesus pointed out, where your treasure is, your heart, with its time, affection, and loyalties, will be there also. Of course, there are many other areas we can invest in besides entertainment that would also expose a divided heart, but let's just consider the issue at hand. How much money do you spend keeping yourself amused? There's the obvious things, of course, movie tickets, cable television, theater and concert seats, cassettes and compact discs, videos, both for rent and purchase, books, vacations, travel, etc. Then there are the items we need to do those things. The TV, the VCR, the entertainment center, the portable CD player, the video camera, the list goes on. Without even getting into the more subtle manifestations of this idolatry, the bigger house, the extra clothes, the fancier car, the average professing Christian in America spends six times more on keeping themselves amused than on all forms of Christian giving combined. When you couple this tragic statistic with the equally tragic realization that so much of the entertainment we cram into ourselves is straight from the pit of hell, well, you can begin to understand why America rots while almost half her citizens claim to be Christian. Paul now gives us the final test. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. When Paul says we should, quote, make the most of every opportunity, end quote, the Greek word is that we must redeem the time. That is, we must buy the time out of the marketplace. There are so many demands for our time today that we have to make time for things that matter to God. Knowing that we are up against a power that is greater than ourselves, we must prayerfully take some steps to limit, if not eliminate, the impact of the entertainment industry in our own lives and the lives of our children. We have to respect our homes, the place where attitudes are formed and lifestyles are developed. Let me give you some specifics. 1. Especially as parents, we must start this process by bringing holiness to our own viewing and recreational habits. It is difficult to help others when we ourselves are still compromising in these areas. 2. We must set a family standard. One writer says, quote, Parents who provide their children with a clear standard of right and wrong empower them to make the best personal and moral choices throughout their life. End quote. These standards must be objective, i.e. based on biblical standards, not based on personal preferences. 3. We must talk with our children about what they're seeing and hearing. Young people rebel when we simply announce that from today on, things are going to be different. This does not mean we need to negotiate with our children and or debate over absolute moral truths and standards, but it does mean our children need to know that our decisions are based on our love for them and for God. 4. Communication with teenagers about all kinds of subjects is absolutely necessary if we hope to guide them through this world to a genuine love for God. We should talk to them about television and talk to them about their interests. We must enter their world to gain credibility. We must get to know their turf. If what they're doing is sinful, we should tell them so in love. But whenever and wherever we can, we should seek to enjoy time with them doing those things they enjoy. In short, we must learn to enjoy them and have fun together. 5. Take practical steps. Don't let a child have a TV in his own bedroom. Put the TV where it can be monitored. Those who have young children should establish rules early. 6. Practice the spiritual disciplines. Pray, pray, pray. Learn the Word of God. It will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Don't close your Bible until you have something from it that will fill your soul for that day.
I've had the good fortune of having parents who have prayed for me regularly. In addition, as a pastor, I have prayer partners who pray for me, knowing that I need their support and prayers. Within the church, we must enlist others to help us, and we must have accountability partners. We can win this war on behalf of our families if we are willing to pay the price. In our current cultural environment, Christians today are forced to deal with making judgments on a whole new genre of questions and issues. For example, how attractive do you have to be before you have the right to feel good about yourself? What can you expect if you were born with a rather ordinary appearance or with a physical disability? Is there a connection between beauty and happiness? Our culture has rendered its judgment on these issues very decisively. You had better look attractive if you will be thought worthy of acceptance and if you expect to be happily married. If you're the unfortunate person, unfortunate enough to have arrived on planet Earth without the gift of beauty, you'd better do something about it or be thrown on the scrap heap of humanity. Today it's not who you are, but how you look that matters. A 30-something woman recently said, To me, plastic surgery was like being converted to a new religion, and it demanded the same commitment and sacrifice. But it was worth it, she says, now that she could see her customized body shaped by innumerable surgeries. She went on to say, it's my body, so I can do whatever I want. If I want it to look a certain way, I have that right. There is something profoundly wrong with our values when young women are starving themselves to death trying to be thin. Looking just right becomes such an obsession that many become detached from reality, unable to process information with a minimum amount of objectivity. In our image-obsessed world, Many young people are quite literally dying to be thin. We have a cult of thin. How superficial. Well, in this segment we will learn how to make biblical judgments on some of those issues. Like what role should physical characteristics play in defining who we are? Is plastic surgery always wrong? What about body piercing, whether with rings or tattoos? How can we use our body for the glory of God? And what can we do to stand against the superficial values of our culture? The biblical account of creation is both simple and profound. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Man was created from the earth so that he could relate to this earthly existence, but he was also created with a spirit with which he could communicate with God. This doctrine of creation means that we are born with what Bill Gothard calls unchangeables, that is, those features over which we have no control. God determined your height, the color of your eyes, your feet, hearing, and the like. We must say, thank you, Father, I accept my features from your wise and loving hand. An ad in a newspaper read, introducing the eyes you wish you had been born with. But is it too much to suggest that if God wanted us to be born with different colored eyes, he would have given them to us? My point is not to say that cosmetic surgery is always wrong or that working toward a slim body is sinful. Rather, I affirm that the vain motivation that often accompanies such improvements is at odds with the will and purpose of the Creator. A skilled plastic surgeon can reshape a face, 